We want to continue our study in the general epistle of James. Last week we looked really at the new life. And now I put it to you that in these verses that we've just read, he is beginning to work out what the new life is like and how they are to live uh, that new life. And therefore, the title I would like to give to our meditation is The New Life. The New Life, because what James is outlining here, not everyone can possibly do. You need to be a Christian to live like a Christian. That's why he speaks about the new birth first. And that's why when some people say there is a difference between uh, the teachings of James and the teachings of Paul, they are wrong. James is building on the same foundation as Paul would build upon. You must be born again, and you must know the new life, because the Christian life is impossible for the unbeliever to live. He cannot do it. He hasn't got the desire, the power, the will, the inclination whatever you want to see, however you want to describe it, he cannot live like this. But also we must realize that in a very real sense, the Christian, the true-hearted Christian, cannot suddenly just automatically think that he can live the Christian life unless he follows what we find here in these verses. James is describing what the new life of the believer should be like. He is to listen and learn and then put into practice what the Word of God teaches. And that's what we find in these verses here. We're going to go through these verses and seek to unpack them and apply them to ourselves this evening. Someone has said regarding, for instance, uh, this verse here, um, verse 19, Wherefore, my beloved brethren, for every man to be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, they have said, the mind of Christ, which dwells in the Christian, will lead him to develop a quick ear, an eloquent silence, and a dull temper. A quick ear. What does that mean? Well, a quick ear, one who's ready to listen, one who's ready to absorb, one who's ready to take in and to listen. An eloquent silence. Well, we don't get much silence sometimes, but it's good to be silent, especially young Christians. It's good to be in, the, in what we would describe the, the sponge mode, where you are absorbing what's been said. Far too often, as James would hint at here, far too often people are quick to speak and a dull temper. Well, what he's talking about here is between being quick to speak, that engenders activity. And very often that activity is not very positive. Very often, in, as we have said last week, in these uh, first century services, the public worship services, they were probably a bit more less informal than ours, and there would be some more discussion. Well, when you get talking, when you get discussion, very often the heat rises, and from discussion comes argument, and from that comes wrath. And this is what he wants to avoid, above all. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath. So, he's talking here about what one has described as clever ears. Clever ears. Let every man be swift to hear. It wasn't that long ago... And, and I'm not referring to anyone that's in this building, but it wasn't that long ago that there was an open-air preacher in Glasgow who is not operating at the moment, but he was, and he was quite well known. And he was preaching away, and as far as he could discern, he had a convert in front of him 
who had just professed faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, a fairly young man. And the young man wanted the microphone and he wanted to speak and the preacher gave him the mic. I believe that's totally against what the Word of God would teach us, totally against what we have here. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, everyone who has just been born again, who has just made a profession of faith, who's just entered into the kingdom of God, let every man first of all be swift to hear. We have to realize that when this wonderful transformation comes upon us, when we are given life whereby we exercise faith and we begin to repent, when this happens, friends, we are nothing but spiritual babes. That's what we are. We are babes in Christ. And does a babe begin to speak the moment that he comes out of the womb? No, he does not. And there's some time before he's able to speak. And so it is with the Christian. The Christian, the new convert, the young Christian, what is it? He is to be swift to hear first and foremost. Because, and indeed, as anyone goes through the Christian life, what they will soon begin to realize, there is so much more to know than you ever realized. And as you make your way in the Christian life, as you grow in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ, what is your estimation of yourself? It's abundantly clear that the more you know, the more you realize you don't know. That's, that's growing. That's what it's like. There's so much in this book. There's so much concerning the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's so much. Yes, we could say the gospel is indeed simple. But it's also extremely profound. And throughout all the ages of eternity, we'll never be able to grasp all that God has done for us in Christ. But nevertheless, we can grow. But we'll never grow until we stop, until we listen, until we absorb, until we fill our minds with these things. Someone again said, and how apt and appropriate this is, Quote, we have two ears and only one tongue in order that, that we may hear more and speak less. It seems in the New Testament times there was a lot of talk, early talk we might say. Well, James is saying no, no, no. It's time to to listen. There'll be plenty time to talk. Now's the time to listen. Now's the time to absorb. Now's the time to take it in. Now's the time to ponder. Now's the time to meditate. And anyone who ever speaks, and I'm sure the minister in here would confirm this, the more that you meditate, the better it will be. That's the way it is, friends. We are to meditate upon these things. And when we come forth to speak, we are to speak after meditating upon these things. This is the way. Peter said in his first epistle in chapter 2, words that are apt and appropriate to quote here, Wherefore, lay aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Peter was talking to Christians who were going to be tested, severely tested. They had been tested and more testing was going to come. And it was going to come in the form of persecution, official persecution. They were going to have a hard time. What was his advice to them? As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. Is this not what he's saying here, James, to us? Absorb the sincere milk of the word. Is this not what he goes on to tell us? That ye may grow thereby. Well, he's urging upon us, upon the new believer. And he may well be urging upon the aged believer too. To have some clever ears to listen. We're too quick to speak. 
listen, respond, take it in. And he also, secondly, he notices here, cautious tongues, cautious tongues, slow to speak, slow. Blessed is the man who, having nothing to say, abstains from giving us wordy evidence of the fact. Is that not a very apt quote? Blessed is the man who, having nothing to say, from giving us, abstains from giving us wordy evidence of the fact. Very often it is those who are quick to speak really have nothing to say. Solomon, as you might expect in the book of Proverbs, has something appropriate here for us in Proverbs chapter 17. And from verse 27 to 28, He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise, and he that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. This is what James is saying here. This is what James is saying in his epistle of practical uh, religion, of practical Christianity, swift to hear, slow to speak. Because when it's like that, friends, we don't end up, we don't end up then being wrathful because he goes on to say, slow to wrath. That's the outcome. But if it's not that way, then we're inclined to be wrathful. And he goes on to say, for the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. And very often, when we're so quick to speak, it leads to confrontation. It leads to difficulties. It leads to wrath. And the wrath of man worketh not the righteousness of God. So, what is he telling us here? He's, he's telling us to be cautious with our tongues. This is all part of the Christian life. This is all part of, of the new life. This is evidence that the Spirit of God has come upon us. When we are quick to hear, when we are slow to speak, which then leads to calm tempers. Calm tempers. The more of the word of truth you hear and absorb, the less irritable you are. And the less you say, the less irritable you make others who have to listen to you. Oh, it's deeply practical, James. James goes right to the heart of the matter. He's talking about a very little organ. He's talking about the tongue. In fact, he goes on, and we'll look at it next week and in other weeks. There's much in this epistle about the tongue, and it's therefore it's apt and appropriate for us to consider this. Let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, because it does not bring about the righteousness of God. It does not advance uh, the cause of Christ. It does nothing to him, to his cause. It does not help in any way. We are to be like Christ himself. And we remember the time when he was before Pilate, when he could have defended himself. He was silent. He never opened his mouth. Then he goes on. Verse 21, for instance, he's telling the newborn Christian, the young Christian, wherefore lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness, and receive with meekness the engrafted word, which is able to save your souls. Minister, did you not say that he's talking to believers? Is this not to believers? 
Why then does he say, which is able to save your souls? Are their souls not saved already? Well, he's talking here about salvation in its widest sense. Yes, friends, when the moment we close in with Christ, the moment that we receive him as Lord and Savior, then we are saved. There's no question about it. But what he's really talking here about is, is the onward sanctification work. That's what he's talking about here. And in order that he might be sanctified, he has been justified when he has received Christ as Lord and Savior. But he has to be sanctified. He has to be prepared for that world that is to come. And God has to do a work in him. And that work is called sanctification. And in order for his sanctification to make progress, he is to accept the word of God and he's not to reject it. This is what he says. Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word. We have to realize that even the Christian doesn't like the Word of God on occasions. It may well be when you're reading the Word of God, it strikes you, it pricks your conscience, and maybe you will move from it and read something else. It may well be that you're in the house of God and the minister is seeking to preach and something he says you don't like. Your conscience is pricked. What do you do? Well, you should recognize if that be the case through your own private reading or coming to the house of God where someone addresses something and it pricks your conscience, you should delight in that. You should recognize that this is God speaking to you. This is God revealing to you something in your life that must be dealt with. But very often, friends, this can be the reaction of Christians. What do they do? They reject the word. They reject it. They don't receive it with meekness, the engrafted word. They say, oh, that's fine. It was for someone else. It wasn't for me. I'm not accepting that from him. No way. It's not for me. When in actual fact, it is for you. And you are to receive with meekness the engrafted word. It may be worthwhile looking at one or two of these words in this verse. He says here, wherefore, lay apart all filthiness. All filthiness. In a medical sense, that word refers to wax in the ear. In a medical sense, that's what it refers to. Wax in the ear. And that may well then be connected with what we were looking at in verse 19. Let every man be swift to hear. And maybe what he's saying here then, when he talks about this uh, filthiness, it is like wax in the ear. And if you have wax in your ear, what is it? You cannot hear too well. Well... If your sins are like wax in the ear, then maybe you're not heeding the word of God as you should do. And you have to cleanse your ears, as it were, in order that the word of God might be heard. Because if your ears are full of wax, you will not hear. And if your life is full of sin, you will not hear the voice of the Lord. It cannot go through because... <coughs> Of your sins. There's another word here following on filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. Now naughty in probably modern parlance is not really a very strong word at all. We might say that a child is naughty and maybe we might equip, uh, equate that with being mischievous. But in our version here, in the King James Version, uh, naughtiness is quite a strong word. It could be treated, uh, could be translated wickedness, or ill will, or evil, or maliciousness. And therefore, he is telling us to get rid of all sin. 
And there must be a willingness within us to part with anything which the Word condemns. That's why we read from John chapter 8. Whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin, and the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. And sin is a terrible thing. It debases us. It is wickedness, ill will, evil. And it is maliciousness. And therefore we've got to get rid of these things. We've got to get rid of them. And then we are to receive that word. That word, that engrafted word, which is able to save our souls. As one said, there must be a weeding followed by a seeding in order for there to be a breeding. A weeding. If you're going to do anything in your garden, if you're going to plant anything, what do you do? You weed it. If you don't weed it, no matter what you put down, it might grow, but the weeds will grow and choke it. There has to be a weeding. You have to get rid of sin in your life. Then there's a seeding. Then the Word of God comes into our lives, this engrafting Word, and it bears fruit in our lives. This is what he's talking about in verse 21, the new life, the weeding, the seeding, which then ultimately leads to the breeding of the new life, the holy life. And then the, finally, these <coughs> last verses from 22 to 25, the main section in what we read earlier. And this could well be summed up by the proof of the pudding is in the eating. The proof of the pudding is in the eating. And this reminds us again that faith is practical. Real faith in the Lord Jesus Christ is evidently practical. It can be seen. It works. It's not just knowledge. It's not just theory. It's not just instruction. It's something that actually changes your life. This is what he's talking about here. There are many things in the Bible that we can know. We can know about the histories. We can know about facts. We can know about figures. But these things in of themselves don't change our lives. But the gospel does. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. And friends, it is there designed to change your life. You have been saved in order that you might be changed and transformed. Because the Christian life is not just theory, it's not just facts. It's a life that has been transformed. And that's why he says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only. Because if that's the case, if you just come to hear, and then when we leave this building or any other building where the Word of God has been proclaimed, and we've heard a sermon maybe that has stirred us, a sermon that has convicted us, a sermon that has revealed to us something that was wrong in our lives, and we have to put right. If we have been stimulated during the sermon, and then we go out and nothing happens, then we are simply hearers. We are like the people that uh, Ezekiel ministered to, who said to him words to this effect, you're just like a good singer. We love to come and hear you sing. And we're entertained. We sit before you and we can find no fault in your preaching. No fault. It's a lovely song. We delight in it. It's orthodox. It's fine. It's according to the word of God. But then when we go out, nothing happens. Lives haven't changed. You may have shed a tear in the congregation. But then when you go out, nothing happens. If the sermon was about being, thou shalt not steal, and you fiddle your tax, it hasn't done any good whatsoever. If the sermon was about the fifth commandment, honour thy father and thy mother, and you don't honour authority, 
then it hasn't done you any good. You've simply just been a hearer, and you've been entertained for a half an hour or whatever, and then it's all over. It's like water off the, or snow off a, a dike. It's made no effect. And this is what he's impressing upon us. But be ye doers of the word, because Christianity is eminently practical. It changes the direction of our lives. And do, do you know what? People can see it. People can see it. Someone spoke about a man who had gone to a, a strange town and he was wanting to get his laundry done. And he was going around looking around the town to see if he could find a laundry. And he saw this sign in the shop, laundry done here. Oh, that's it. So he went, he got his clothes and he went into the shop and he said to the, the assistant, when can I pick up my clothes? The assistant said, what are you talking about? Oh, you've got a sign there, laundry done here. We only make the signs. That's all we do. Is that your life? We only have the signs? There's not the reality? James is telling us we have to be doers of the word. What is the difference, friends? What is the difference between a tree and a post? Or we put it in, in our own terms, our human terms. What's the difference between a Christian and an unbeliever? The Christian is like the tree. You plant the tree, it grows. The unbeliever is like the post. You put it in the ground and what happens? It decays. There's no life in it. No life whatsoever. But Christianity is life. And the Word of God is powerful. It changes. It's life. It's spirit. And it changes us. This is what James is impressing upon them. And if we simply hear the word, we are deceiving ourselves. And we notice, friends, because the Bible teaches us this, that it's so easy to, to deceive ourselves because our hearts are deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. We don't need any help in deceiving ourselves because we have by nature hearts that deceive us. Well, if we're hearing sermons, whether they be here or anyone else, and we're entertained, and there's no change of life. We are deceiving ourselves. So there's two, two classes of healers before, here marked out. For if any, verse 23, be a healer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. What's he talking about here? Well, he's talking about here, in modern terms, someone who's got up in the morning, he's got a lot to do, he's got a busy schedule, he's had his breakfast, he's had his shower, he's just about to go out the door, the mirror's there, he looks at his hair, he looks at his jacket, it's okay, I'm off. That's it. He looks presentable. He's done all he can. He's away. He's just gazed at the mirror. And he's away. He's made one or two adjustments. But he's had it. He's off. He's into the world. He's gone about his daily duties. And there's nothing wrong in that. But the point is. Many, many Christians are just like that. They're into the word of God. They read it. This moment or two. They're away. They forgot everything they've ever read. And they're away into the world. And the word has made no difference to them whatsoever. Then there is the other group. The gazing type. But whoso looketh into the perfect law of liberty. That's the word of God. And friends, the more that we absorb the word of God. And the more that it changes us. We find its liberty. Freedom. Real freedom. And continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, because we are all inclined to be by nature forgetful. 
Why is it that often the Bible tells us, remember, remember, remember? Because by nature, we don't retain the things in the Word of God that we should. Oh, we can hold on to the things of the world very easy, but not the things of God. He be not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work. Working out our salvation with fear and trembling friends is a work. It's not a work that saves us. Jesus saves us, but the, it, there is a work in it. This man shall be blessed in his deed. It says here in verse 25, just to close, but whoso looketh, it's a strong word, very strong word. You'll, you'll be reminded of the time when the disciples, on the first day of the week, when they went to the tomb, what did they do? They went in there and they looked. They looked into the tomb. And do you think they glanced? Do you think they just had one look and then out? They had put Jesus in the tomb. He wasn't there. And when they went to that tomb, on the first day of the week, they looked, they gazed. They looked at that tomb and they found it was empty. So it is with one who goes to the word of God. We are to gaze at it, we are to look at it. Because when we look at the word of God, what do we see? We see ourselves not a physical picture, but a spiritual picture of our souls. That's what we see. And very often, we don't see something that we like. And that's why we've got to deal with it. We don't see something, or we, I should say, we do see something that we don't like. And this word, looketh, it's strong. It's the word that's been used when the disciples went to the tomb. It's also the word that's used when the angels are looking on what's happening in the church as far as redemption is concerned. We are told in Peter that they, they seem to peer over and they look into the church and they're amazed because when they look into the church and what God is doing, they find out what God is doing in the church. And they don't just take a passing glance. No. They're earnestly looking into this and they are being informed of what God is doing. That's the way we are to go to the Word of God. Go to it. It doesn't reveal our faces. It reveals, if you like, the face of our souls, our true standing before God. And we'll see things there that we don't like. And we are to deal with them. Lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. It's when we ponder, it's when we meditate upon the Word of God that our real condition is revealed to us. But it's that man who labors in it. This man shall be blessed. This man, oh, he might be cut to the heart. Yes, his pride might be cut. He might think nothing of himself. He will know something more of that beatitude. Blessed is he that hungereth and thirsteth after righteousness, for he shall be filled. That's the new life, friends. That's the new life according to James. Amen. May God bless his word to us. Let us pray together.